Good morning, Dog Nation. I am Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans presented today by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. We're happy to have you with us. What's a really fun show for us. A lot of this week, as you would imagine, is going to be about building up to G-Day on Saturday and what we get a chance to see with our own eyes. We're certainly uh, looking forward to starting that today. Our good friend John Stinchcomb also helps us do that there as well. And yet, to begin the show today, There is a really interesting note out there as it relates to UGA recruiting. The biggest name of this 2025 class has delivered a very, very strong message here today that I don't think needs to be missed. And so we're going to talk about that and give some context for why it's important. Also, whispers, rumors, reports, if you will, from Georgia's second scrimmage behind closed doors there on Saturday. We'll touch all of those bases. We are so happy to have you with us for it. Let's say we get it going right now then. It is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia, and it begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Pella Window and Door of Georgia, viewed to be the best. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. We are going to talk a lot today about the quarterback position. You know, you never want to try to do too much of one thing, but obviously if you're ever going to overdo it in any one spot, quarterback probably a pretty fun position to do that with. So some of this related to what we might see on G-Day on Saturday. In fact, that comes up a few minutes from now. Some of this also related to the continuing Uh, I guess, saga going on with UGA recruiting, in particular the quarterback position, playing a pivotal role in that 2025 class. So let's spend a couple of minutes on this and then want to transition after that to some very interesting notes that came out of Georgia's second scrimmage behind closed doors there on Saturday. But to begin with, the last time we spoke here on this program, we were reacting to the fact that Matt Zollers, a four-star quarterback from Pennsylvania, had chosen, I should say, Missouri over Georgia in his commitment ceremony there on Thursday. And what we were trying to figure out at the time was, okay, well, what does this mean? Because there were some Georgia fans that obviously liked Zollers. Georgia certainly had given Zollers the the benefit of a visit and seemed to roll out the red carpet for him pretty well. And so the question we were all trying to sift through is, you know, what does it mean that Georgia seemingly was showing interest in Zollers and ultimately that Zollers chose Missouri? Like, where did that leave Georgia? And on our show on Friday, our recruiting insider Jeff Sintel gave us a pretty forceful statement that no matter how much you may have seen the talk and the chatter about Zollers and other quarterbacks that we'll also get to here in a moment, there is, as Jeff believes, a top priority for Georgia in this 2025 class. And his words were unmistakable on Friday's show. Let's hear this as a reminder to set us up for where we need to go today. Here's Jeff Sintel from Friday. The best quarterback Georgia can possibly sign in this class is Julian Juju Lewis. Um, I, I don't mind saying that. I think he's the best possible quarterback Georgia could sign. Uh, I think it's because of his track record. It's not just the ratings and the rankings. It's because of what he's been able to do in his high school career against the very best of the best. Um, nobody's ever going to discount his competition, as some people will say, hey, look at this quarterback or that quarterback. Um I think Julian will play great football in college. It's just how do you get him to the right school? He's currently committed to to USC. And I, I wanna I wanna just my thoughts, Brandon, is I've always felt that and, and listen, I've had conversations with Julian and his camp. I, I know Julian and his camp feel like they have always been the priority of the University of Georgia. That's where it gets really interesting. That no matter what you're hearing about other guys right now, Julian Lewis's camp, which is his family and the people that are close to him. They believe that Juju has always been Georgia's number one quarterback priority for this 2025 class for as long as Julian's been in the 2025 class. Obviously, at one point in time, he reclassified, originally supposed to be a part of the class of 2026. Now, there are two reasons why that statement matters, that Lewis is the priority for Georgia, according to Lewis and Lewis's people here. Reason number one that matters is because we continue to hear about Georgia and other quarterbacks besides Julian Juju Lewis. That's what last week was about. A lot of chatter about Zollers and the people who like Zollers and we're hoping that Zollers might commit to, to Georgia or concern that Missouri allegedly used an NIL offer to prevent that from happening. A lot of chatter about Zollers last week, and yet the Lewis camp seems to believe, according to Jeff Sintel, that they're still Georgia's number one priority at this position. The other reason why that's kind of interesting is because 
Zollers is not the only quarterback we are also hearing of as late in comparison to Ju Julian Juju Lewis in this class of 2025. There's an interesting story at dognation.com going back to Friday, but another quarterback, the four-star Ryan Montgomery, who much like Zollers was on a fairly accelerated pace in terms of uh, announcing his commitment decision. You know, it sounds like, you know, right now Montgomery is on also a pretty rapid ascension here in terms of trying to decide where he wants to play his college ball. I want to read you a few sentences here from the story at dognation.com involving uh, Montgomery uh, from, from just at the end of last week. Let me read this to you. So Jeff says, the four-star from Finley, Ohio, just spent the weekend visiting Florida. Still got a strip to see South Carolina for its spring game on April 20th. Uh, Jeff writes, it also appears that he's taken his last trip to check out UGA before his decision. Dog Nation has learned that Montgomery has, listen to this now, pulled his June official visit to UGA off his calendar. Jeff says Montgomery will now visit in early May. He's going to make an official visit to the school that month. He'll take another unofficial visit in June to the school, which earned his commitment. That's going to be in the works so he can help build that class. Now, Jeff writes, there's no question he's an immediate take at Florida and South Carolina. This is Ryan Montgomery. He says the belief is that Montgomery is the only quarterback prospect the Gamecocks are focused on. Jeff goes on to write, though, the question remains whether he's going to be an immediate take with the Bulldogs. Did the Zollers news change that status? The Montgomery camp isn't sure about that this time. He's, uh, he, Jeff writes, there's also a need for clarity about what Julian Juju Lewis plans to do. The nation's number nine overall quarterback prospect remains a major target for Georgia in this 2025 cycle. The Bulldogs might be waiting to see if Lewis finalizes his decision before moving to Montgomery. If that's the case, the window there is closing. So let me kind of recap all of this. Much like Matt Zollers, who made a commitment announcement before Julian Juju Lewis even took his Georgia official visit, which is still slated for the end of May, the kind of right there at the beginning of June, that sort of weekend that overlaps all of that. Ryan Montgomery is now planning on doing the same thing. He's going to commit somewhere in May when there will be no, I'm assuming, finality on what's happening with Julian Lewis, at least publicly. And Montgomery is going to choose between, as Jeff seems to tell it there, Florida, South Carolina, and perhaps Georgia also being a hat on the table. Well, what if three quarterbacks who we've heard Georgia being the mix for, Zollers, Montgomery, and Lewis, what if two of those guys announce their commitment prior to Lewis even taking his official visit to Georgia? Is that an example of reading the tea leaves here and by process of elimination, all of a sudden Georgia fans are left to conclude, wow, Georgia might be a lot more of a player for Julian Juju Lewis than any of us maybe at one point in time realized. I would say there'd be a way of interpreting that where, you know, perhaps that might sound true. I think one of the things, though, that's given some Georgia fans some hesitancy about assuming that is because we're led to believe that perhaps more so than any player in recent memory, Julian Lewis's recruitment might largely be about NIL, perhaps more so than Georgia's even comfortable with. And there's all this chatter about that. We've probably contributed some of that here on the show, but but lots of chatter about just how much NIL would be a factor for Lewis's recruitment. Well, over the course of the weekend, Julian Lewis, perhaps aware of what some people are saying, what some message boards have written, what, what social media has had to say. And Julian Lewis had a very forceful response on all of this. And I think we need to take Lewis's words here incredibly seriously. This was kind of unsolicited, but nonetheless, incredibly forceful. Lewis saying, I've always picked development over money. NIL was legal in other states, but I stayed in Georgia to play for Joey King. That's his head coach at Carrollton. King, a very respected coach, as many of you know, was Trevor Lawrence's high school coach when both were at Cartersville before Lawrence went to Clemson. He says, I, I stayed in Georgia to play for Coach Joey King, to be ready for the next level. Hearing rumors about me and my family, but the only thing you need to believe are my actions. Hashtag trust God. Hashtag keep working. So Lewis says, I'm hearing all this stuff that I'm all about NIL and I'm chasing dollars and things like that. But actually, I've always been more about development than I've been given credit for. Uh, the fact that I stayed at Carrollton to work for with Joey King is proof of that. And I'm going to hear. I'm going to tell you something. I think that Julian Lewis needs to be taken very seriously on this. And I think his words, the fact that he wanted to put this message out there, I, I think people ought to respect the message that he's putting out because I will tell you behind the scenes there were a lot of rumors that Lewis might not stay in the state of Georgia. Being a USC commit, 
he might go out to California, a place that had a little bit more of an aggressive NIL law, and he might cash in right away. Now, there's also some people who believe that the NIL laws in Georgia were changed in part because of Lewis. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. I don't know. But but Lewis, up to this point in time, has chosen to stay at Carrollton High School and working with Joey King is something that's apparently really important to him. And when Lewis says, listen, the perception that some of y'all have of me doesn't match reality, you know, I, I think we need to take him pretty seriously on that. And I think we need to give him some respect there on that. And, I mean, I'll, I'll just tell you, I, you know, to me, this kind of follows a similar line of thought to maybe it's the way that some of us you know, have kind of grown to view Carson Beck. I, I've told you before, I've tried to be as candid about this as I could be. There was a time when it came to Carson Beck, who is obviously Georgia's starting quarterback right now and maybe a guy who's going to go on and uh, have a Heisman Trophy level year and become a first-round pick. There was a time in which, I think I've been honest about this, I wasn't quite so sure what Georgia had in Beck. I wasn't quite so sure what Beck was. I wasn't quite so sure Beck was into the right stuff when, you know, 2020, he's here at a time in which Georgia and its quarterback situation was kind of a mess. Yet in Beck's first year, we never really heard anything about him. Then in 2021, he got his chance to to maybe be the starter uh, uh, against UAB. There was sort of some premature discussion that he was going to be that. Then he wasn't, and apparently, as Beck tells him, he wasn't quite ready for that moment then. And so going into last year's spring, you know, I was kind of left to wonder, is, is, is Carson Beck into the right stuff? Is Carson Beck made of the right stuff in the way that, that he can be the kind of quarterback a place like Georgia needs for him to be? Well, over the course of the last year, I've discovered that whatever misgiving I might have had about Beck and what he was about has turned out to be totally wrong. And I don't care if he's driving a Lamborghini or seven Lamborghinis. The fact of the matter is, Beck, much the same way that Julian Lewis says, I'm dedicated to development. I'm dedicated to being the best quarterback that I could be. Well, I've grown to believe that's exactly what you know Beck is about there as well. And so no, no matter what wild rumors you hear about him in NIL or what kind of car he's driving or what may have happened for him when he was much younger in his past in terms of trying to take the next step here at Georgia. The truth is, is right now Carson Beck appears to be, by every ability I have to discern, exactly the kind of young man he's supposed to be to be the top quarterback in all of college football. And learning that about Beck over these years, maybe that's the same kind of thing that's going on with Julian Juju Lewis too. That Lewis has always gotten an incredible level of attention, but it's not like he's out there cultivating that. It's not like he's out there doing all these flashy things to get that attention. I think for the most part, he sort of sidestepped a lot of that. And when he says, listen, some of y'all assume I'm more about NIL than I really am. I'm about development more so than you realize. I think we need to take him seriously on that and, and, and respect the fact that he says there is a perception out there about me that doesn't quite match reality. And he's going to have a chance over the course of the next few years to show the world, no matter where he chooses to go to school, exactly what it is that he is about. I thought that message for him this week was certainly worth uh, bringing up here on this show. Now, one final point on this topic. If it is true that Lewis is more about development than NIL, well, of course, the kind of high school coach you'd want to play for is a guy like Joey King because of the success that he's had in the past. And we're led to believe that if you're about development, if you're about being the best possible football player you can be, there's no better place for you to be than the University of Georgia. And we have another piece of evidence that proves just how true that is. Did you see the other day where ESPN ranked their top coaches in college football? And we'll get more into the top 10 of this list a little bit later on. But I thought it was interesting that the guy at the very top of the list was Georgia's coach Kirby Smart. By now, we've gotten used to seeing Smart you know, being at the top of all these lists. But what was uh, interesting to note here is of the panelists for ESPN.com that voted on this, all 10 of those panelists gave Kirby Smart their top 10, or I should say their, their, their number one overall uh, you know, vote. The fact that he hasn't lost to any coach currently active uh, you know, in the Power Five and all that kind of stuff, or you know, whatever the stat is. Uh, 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 you know, uh, I'll, I'll just read what it says. It says, Smart's unbeaten against all active coaches over the past five seasons. His only loss in that span are to Saban, Dan Mullen in Florida, Ed Orgeron at LSU, then Will Muschamp at South Carolina. His consistency is what sets him apart, and Smart, I think, himself would say that there as well. But the point is, overwhelmingly viewed to be the number one coach in college football by everyone who is voting as a part of this there at ESPN.com. So if Julian Lewis says, listen, some of y'all think all I'm about is NIL, but what I'm really about is developing and being the best player I can be, well, if, if, if that's what you're really about – then Georgia, we would think, is obviously the right place for you because Kirby Smart and his coaching staff right now, according to ESPN, head and shoulders better 
than everybody else. And who knows, based on the actions of Zollers and now the accelerated timeline for Montgomery, maybe all of this is a little bit of a collection of tea leaves that need to be read. Maybe it's all suggesting that maybe Juju really is eventually on his way to UGA. So we'll follow that. Let me shift gears now and talk about something completely different here for a moment. Georgia on Saturday had its second spring scrimmage behind closed doors. Media fans, for the most part, not there to see that. But it's all a precursor to what's going to go down on G-Day this upcoming Saturday. And we're all going to get our chance to see that. Of course, our, our friends over Dog uh, at Dog Nation, our colleagues here, Connor Riley, uh, Mike Griffith, they had their sources on all this from Saturday. And at DogNation.com and different stories, they were writing about some of the things that they saw. So I wanted to take a moment to highlight some of that first from Connor Riley uh, reporting that among those scoring touchdowns for Georgia in the closed door scrimmage on Saturday were Arian Smith and Colby Young. Uh, obviously Smith, the veteran who's been at Georgia for a while, Young, the recent Miami transfer. Connor goes on to say this marks the second straight scrimmage where Smith has hauled in a long touchdown pass. He loved to hear that. Obviously we all remember how pivotal he was in Georgia's come from behind win against Ohio State in the Peach Bowl at the conclusion of the 2022 season. And uh, Connor also reporting that Smith's had a very strong spring for Georgia uh, here this year. Connor goes on to write that the folks at the scrimmage said it was an improved day for the Georgia defense, in particular the defensive line with the run game. If you remember last week we talked about that being a lingering, ongoing concern for Georgia. And Mike Griffith in his piece at DogNation.com pointing out among the defensive linemen apparently having a good day, Christian Miller. And When you make a list of those defensive linemen that could really step up and emerge for Georgia, Miller is certainly one of the guys that you see prominently factored there on that list. So there you go, a couple of inside notes from what happened at the Georgia scrimmage there on Saturday. Bottom line on all this is, what a fun time this is to be watching Georgia football. We're heading towards G-Day on Saturday. That's a really, really big deal. And then after that, the 2025 recruiting class kicks into high gear as well. Georgia's got some major commitment announcements, we believe, on the way. And the biggest of them all could be Julian Juju Lewis. Currently a USC commit, but apparently wide open for anybody, including Georgia, who, based on some other rumors and reports that are out there, may be working to gain the inside track. Fun next few months as we watch everything happening for Georgia football. My name's Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented today by Pella, window and door of Georgia. We are happy to have you with us, no matter how you get to us today. Video 10 a.m. across all platforms, radio, Athens Sports Radio, 960 The Ref, podcast there as well. However you choose to be a part of the show, just so glad to have you with us, and so thankful to our friends at Pella, window and door of Georgia, who make it all possible. I love driving around, and I'm always seemingly out and about doing a bunch of stuff. You see a lot of new construction around our area, and you can always tell, like, the best builders putting the best care towards the the, the the home that they're building. When you see that yellow Pella window sticker on those brand new windows being installed in those homes, when you do see that. Because I think, you know, really uh, discerning builders, discerning homeowners really understand that the uh, best product you can put to take the best possible care of your home or give it the highest construction quality are Pella windows and doors. They're viewed to be the best. We've said that for a long time. And when you look at your own home, perhaps this sort of spring time of year when we kind of have spring cleaning on our mind and, you know, getting our homes in sort of tip-top shape, maybe it's time for you to upgrade your windows and doors so that your home can feel better on the inside. Perhaps you'll save some money on those energy bills, look better on the outside. Curb appeal always really matters. Well, if that be the case for you, if you're ready for a discussion like that, our friends at Pella are ready for you there as well. You can stop by and see them at their Experience Center there in Duluth, and you can put your hands in the product and sort of feel what makes it different, feel what makes it better. Or you can have one of the Pella experts come out to you and talk to you directly. It's not a pressure consultation. It's simply an, it's simply an informative discussion on exactly why uh, it's the right time for you to, to upgrade to Pella Windows and doors for your home here today. A couple of ways for you to get in touch there as well. You can give them a call, 678-638-1429. That's 678-638-1429. You can also reach out online, PellaofGA.com slash Dog Nation. PellaofGA.com slash Dog Nation for more on that. Also take advantage of great savings right now because between now and April 30th, you can get 10% off a of Pella project and 0% APR for 24 months with payments. So there you go. Good stuff coming up from Pella Window and Door of Georgia. We've also got some good stuff coming up here in a moment with our good friend, the former UGL American, John Stinchcomb, 
Prior to that, I want to go around the doghouse, which is poured today by our friends at Dr. Pepper. And when I make the list of the things that I'm the most interested in seeing for GD, I told you we're kind of quarterback heavy on the program here today. Obviously, we continue to hear, and, and both Mike and Connor had some of this for you at dognation.com, that Carson Beck is having a very strong spring of practice. We would expect that he would. He's firmly entrenched as the starter. But it's the guy after him, maybe the heir apparent, but certainly the guy waiting the wings, Gunnar Stockton, who I am, I think, really almost as much as anybody else intrigued to see on G-Day on Saturday because I want to see the steps of development that Gunnar's been taking. I want to see what Gunnar Stockton is, is showing here. I still believe that for all the chatter about Juju, which is justified, and all the talk about other quarterbacks, Ryan Puglisi or you know guys that could have been here like Dylan Ryle or whatever else, that for me, the most exciting quarterback potentially of the future for Georgia, for me right now, is still Gunnar Stockton. I just like Gunnar a lot, and I'm hoping that we all get a chance to see that on Saturday. So as someone who has big belief in Gunnar and thinks that Gunnar himself can be a really good player, the update we got from Kirby Smart last week on Gunnar I thought was incredibly valuable. So in light of the fact that for me and many of you, he's one of the most interesting players for Georgia's G-Day spring scrimmage next week, Let's get a reminder of the update that Kirby gave us last week on Gunner's progress thus far this spring. Here's Kirby Smart. Gunner's done a good job. I've seen growth in Gunner. I thought he had a couple uh, stakes in the scrimmage, but he also played with much more consistent with consistency. I've I've seen this progression with Gunner that like he's getting better. Each and every practice, you know, the bowl practices were great for him. The ability to play in that bowl game was awesome for him. Uh, he's gotten better. He's getting a feel for our system. He's a really good athlete. He has every now and then, a, you know, a mistake that you can't have at that position. The good thing for him is you can ask him after the play, and I always ask him, what did you see? What was the coverage? He gives the right answer. So he's seeing the right things. Um, but he's got to continue to develop and grow and uh, that's a that's a that's that's a hard position to play, and um, he's still trying to master that uh, position. So, I think that's a very I think first of all candid update, kind of wide ranging from Kirby Smart on Stockton, and obviously a lot more positive than not. And if you're a Georgia fan, you take some good things from that. And let me tell you why I think G Day in particular can be a really important day for Stockton. You know, I think there's an aspect of what Stockton can do well when he plays. We saw some of this during the Orange Bowl game where she got a chance to kind of factor prominently in. There's some stuff that Stockton can do in a game like that that I don't know quite plays into G-Day quite as much. You know, G-Day is not about running around. It's not the sort of high-intensity moment in which Gunner seemed to embrace during his high school career. This is a little bit more about standing in the pocket and being pretty. And... You know, I'll, I'll give a comparison here. Like, that was never Stetson Bennett's glory, right? Stetson Bennett was not a great G-Day quarterback. In fact, when Bennett was a national champion of the 2021 season for his 2022 G-Day, some of y'all remember this, certainly if, you know, there was no shortage of, like, you know, uh, bad actor trolls who were trying to, you know, turn, you know, Bennett's G-Day into some sort of controversy. But Stetson during the 2022 G-Day was only 15 for 35, he did have 273 yards, but he had three touchdowns and two picks. So he completed far less than half of his passes and threw two interceptions. In other words, Stetson Bennett was not necessarily a great G-Day player because the thing that Bennett did so well in a game was running around and handling pressure moments. And that's just not what G-Day is. I would say that Gunner is a little bit like that in terms of if he gets a chance to beat Georgia's starting quarterback, you're going to like his moxie and his toughness uh, as much as anything else, and that's not really what G-Day is. So if Gunner can sort of stand there and look pretty, make pretty throws, stand tall in the pocket and really deliver it, something that Stetson Bennett was not always great at doing, even though Bennett was a Georgia great quarterback, I do think this gives you a pretty good window into how good Gunner can eventually be. I don't, in other words, think G-Day is the best overall showcase for his talents, but if he plays well on G-Day, then who knows what he could do in sort of a live, real football situation later on the fall if called upon. But either way, he's one of the players on Saturday I'm most interested in seeing, and hearing what Kirby Smart says right there makes me even more interested in seeing what he brings to the table this upcoming weekend. And that is Around the Doghouse, poured today by our friends at Dr. Pepper. And, of course, when you are thinking about college football, and right now we are because we're getting ready for 
uh, that G-Day coming up on Saturday. We think about our friends from Dr. Pepper. We love the Fansville commercials. We love everything that goes down there on that. And we love, and this is for me genuine, the rich, one-of-a-kind flavor of Dr. Pepper. It's a pepper thing. There are 23 flavors in Dr. Pepper, and, of course, I know that because I kind of consider myself a little bit of a Dr. Pepper expert, whether it's the Dr. Pepper Zero Sugar. I like diet Dr. Pepper. I enjoy the uh, the regular flavor of Dr. Pepper every now and then, too. Uh, when I get a chance to do that, it's so much more than just a soda. It's the rich, one-of-a-kind flavor. So when you're stopping at your local Kroger or wherever you're doing your shopping, make sure you pick up some Dr. Pepper today because it's truly a pepper thing. And we're so happy to have Dr. Pepper pouring around the doghouse for us here today. All right, we got a lot to do as far as our program goes. Important update to come on our Golden Shoe Bracket Challenge. We are down to the wire and... The final here is, I think, statistically speaking, still up for grabs. we got some interesting stuff on that. There is a wild story coming out of the SEC coaching ranks. We'll give that to you here today. How about the top competition for Kirby Smart as college football's top coach? ESPN had some interesting things to say about all of that. So we got ground to cover here before we are done. But for now, on everything happening for Georgia, as we get ready for G-Day on Saturday, always great to have John Stinchcomb here today on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Pella, window and door of Georgia. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. Let me bring in John Stinchcomb on the uh, topic we were just discussing. John, does it make sense when I say that I don't know that Gunnar Stockton, the G-Day format, is the best showcase for his talents? Because I think of him as a tough guy. I think of him as a guy that wants to run. I think of him as a guy that, you know, based on the moments when I saw him during his high school career, seemed to handle pressure pretty well, you know, both – the actual tangible pressure on the field, but also the sort of general pressure of playing big and big games. But to me, he's a little bit like what a Stetson Bennett could have been for UGA in terms of it's the intangible characteristics that made him so good. G-Day is a little bit more about standing there and just looking pretty. And Bennett didn't always thrive in that particular situation. So if Gunner has a really good day throwing the ball on Saturday when you're not really running and there is no pressure and it's just sort of, you know, you know kind of a glorified version of a practice – then to me that speaks even more of what he can be in sort of a real game during the fall. I find Gunnar Stockton, Georgia's backup quarterback, fascinating. One of the players I'm most intrigued by seeing for this upcoming weekend. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I, I think it's an assessment of how do you fit within the system. When the system is working, can you work the system? And for Gunnar Stockton, what we know about him is his athleticism, his ability to create off-schedule plays. And, and you listen to Coach Smart's comments – Obviously, that's a strength of his game. But for G-Day, it's can you operate and, and work through your progression as we present it? I, there is familiarity by this point in, in camp where, you know, the defense knows what you're going to run. We're not going to try to create opportunities with formation. That's not what G-Day is about. G-Day is in the nuts and bolts and the meat and potatoes of this offense. Can you work through what we create for you? And read a defense, see where your keys are, and and manage those situations. That doesn't really bode well for a guy like uh, – I, I don't know if a bode well is the right way to phrase it, but he's, a, he's somebody where his athleticism is going to be minimized, his ability to create off-schedule plays will be minimized, they're going to be quick to whistle, and you know defense is going to claim that they have 54 sacks in, in this – contest because yeah. that's what defensive <laughs> linemen do uh but but ultimately it's it's going to be an opportunity for him to show that he has progressed there has been uh, a great deal of of uh just acclimation to what the system is and that he'll be prepared when and if that opportunity arises and obviously uh georgia fans only want to see him when there's a four touchdown cushion, and now we get to see Beck's backup this year. But uh, I think Gunner brings a lot to the table, and, and there's a reason why they continue to sing his praises when they talk about him. Yeah, I mean, to me, there are two things going on here. Thing number one, as you pointed out, you know, if you want to be as bulletproof as possible for a run to a national championship, you've got to have a backup quarterback who's capable of playing. Now, obviously, everybody hopes that Carson Beck just sails right on through for. What is it, 16, 17 games, however long the season's going to be here upcoming. 
But we also know that backup quarterbacks have been a thing, right? We've, you know, we've been forced to pay attention to a lot of championship contenders and their backup quarterbacks. It could be certainly a possibility in such a tough physical sport in the SEC that a guy like Stockton is called upon at some point in time here this upcoming season, and you want him to be ready if that's the case. But beyond that, you know, there is chatter of would Georgia go to the transfer portal for a quarterback because Kirby wants four scholarship quarterbacks. We'll get to Julian Lewis here in a moment. Is, is, is Julian Lewis eventually going to join into Georgia's 2025 class? A lot of the chatter about the future of the Georgia quarterback position, you know, is going to be impacted by whether or not Gunnar Stockton looks like the kind of quarterback who could be a capable starter for Georgia in 2025. If that's the case, then the entire temperature and that whole discussion is brought down a little bit. I don't want to make more of this than it is, but if Gunner goes out there on Saturday and doesn't really look the part, it doesn't look good, well, all of a sudden now you're a little bit more, and perhaps this is overstated, it probably is, but you're a little bit more panicked about, okay, well, you know, you know, what is the, the the pecking order? What's the hierarchy? What's what's next for Georgia after Carson Beck at quarterback? The, the Gunner, by playing well on Saturday, among the kind of fan base, uh, the sort of broad, you know, broadly speaking, dog nation, he can kind of bring that temperature down a little bit by saying, hey, when Carson leaves, we're fine. I'm the guy, and we'll see what happens after that. But but I've been waiting for my moment the same way that Carson waited for his moment, and I'm ready to do all of this. Uh, a big performance on Saturday could go a long way towards really kind of casting that narrative, I believe. Yeah, I, I think Georgia fans are always excited about the potential of having a dual-threat quarterback, and Gunner comes uh, about as close as you can to checking that box, especially in recent history for Georgia. I think fans were excited that Stetson could create some opportunities and continue drives with his legs. And uh, it's funny that we're at a point now where we're talking about, man, it, we really need a fourth quarterback <laughs> on scholarship. But that's where the Georgia program is now. You're talking about depth on depth and uh, most seasons, I, 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 including this one, I don't really want to see a whole lot of meaningful action for your twos and threes. I want them to come in when, you know, it's the, the lead is comfortable and now you get some good quality reps against an opponent. But uh, that's where Georgia football has continued to build. And now we're hearing the conversation not about, hey, I'm worried that we have the guy, but now we're talking about how do we make sure that iron continues to sharpen iron. And one, we have good practice reps because that's what the three and four quarterback can provide. They're the, they're the look team. They're getting good reps, but also you've got to provide a good look for uh, your, your number one defense come regular season. Um, and also be ready for the uh-ohs that might happen in a season as well as that next year coaches are already thinking how can we be as well prepared as possible for that 2025 season so where where are our players at in their progression who do we think we might lose how do we develop that depth uh is there is there availability in the transfer portal or potential guys that we've already established relationships that's the ongoing process of coaching at this level and uh, Coach Smart and his staff are, are second to none when it comes to preparedness and awareness of what's going on, what they need, what the needs are now, and what their needs are in the future. So we began the show today by highlighting a recent uh, X post from Julian Juju Lewis, the five-star quarterback. And you know, I take his words here really seriously. He feels like he's been miscast. He feels like that he's been uh, misunderstood, maybe is the better way to say that, that according to his telling, is he's far more about development being the best football player he can be and not nearly as much about NIL as perhaps some people have assumed that he is. What do you make of the fact that he felt strongly enough about this kind of unsolicited to sort of put this out here of I'm hearing things about me that are not true. Julian's still a very young guy, but he's obviously, you know, processing all of this and wanting to correct the record on his own behalf here. What do you make about the fact that Lewis felt strongly enough about this to, to get it out there in the open? Yeah, well, I think there's a ton of assumptions that are made across the board, especially for these high school athletes, as to why they're looking at certain places and why they're not looking at others. Um, and obviously, NIL is a major factor for a number of players. For him to come out and say, hey, that's not my top priority, I think speaks to 
a, a depth of commitment to what he's looking for in a program. He, his goals exceed far past can I play well at the college level? I mean, he's, he's, I think like many that are highly gifted and talented, they're saying what prepares me for uh, the smoothest path or the, the best path to finding that success in a space that he's truly gifted. And I, I, that's the, the wise sage route of, you know, I'm not worried about the, the instant dollar for all these quarterbacks at these high programs, they're going to be compensated well. I think that's the understanding of where the landscape is for college quarterbacks, especially in you know some of the the major conferences, the top forty teams at the the very worst. So he understands that what's more important. I think it's similar to uh, Arch Manning. I know we didn't win out on that one, but uh, NIL was a a might have been a factor, but it certainly was further down the list and. Uh, Julian's come out and said the same thing of what matters most to me is what mattered most to players pre NIL. They're looking for the best fit, the best situation. How do I develop as a player? How can I fit into the culture and what situation will be best for me uh, with the big picture in mind? And I also think there's a weird kind of taboo thing going on here where You know, money's kind of always been a little bit of a taboo. People get nervous talking about it. In the case of NIL, I think players believe they're supposed to pretend that NIL doesn't exist. There's a a really weird conversation that goes on where, like, we talk about recruiting, we're always talking about the present factor of NIL. When we talk about individual recruits, somehow NIL is never a factor for an individual recruit, uh, and, and they're sort of led to believe that's what they're supposed to say. On the one hand, I totally understand why they do, because in cases like Nico Imaleva at Tennessee, speaking openly about NIL brought scrutiny, which came with an NCAA investigation. Well, clearly you don't want to do that. There's also this thing that's out there where, like look at Carson Beck and his Lamborghini. When there are open signs of NIL and things like that, some people kind of latch on that and say, oh, this proves this guy's about something else other than football, and no player wants to have that label attached to his name. The point that I'm getting to, John, is, would we be better served if it was just a little easier to talk about some of this kind of stuff out in the open without making it seem like it was some sort of sin to to make the money you're now legally able to make? In a couple of minutes on the show, we'll talk more about John Calipari leaving Kentucky and going to Arkansas, and money is a huge part of that discussion. Would it be so wrong if we were a little bit more open and free to discuss, you know, what are the financial ramifications of choosing school A over choosing school B? What are the real dollars attached to you. It just seems like right now we're still not allowed to do that, no matter how prevalent NIL actually is. Yeah, and I think it's because the target continues to move from the NCAA. I mean, you talk about some schools that are under uh, facing significant or maybe insignificant persecution for how they operate their NIL in relation to players and student athletes and potential student athletes. It's such a wild west where, you know, players are going, I don't want to do anything to jeopardize my situation or the school's situation, but it's a factor. So I I think the fact that it's such a, it's not run well across the board, that there are different standards of, of operating procedure, depending on the school, that players are a little more cautious to talk about it. Obviously, nobody wants to come across as greedy. Mm-hmm. Not even NFL players are, uh, you know, wanting to say, "Oh, I want to. I, I care more about the mighty dollar." But it's a factor. I mean, you're talking about there are kids that are making decisions, saying, "I can go to a place and make three hundred thousand, or I can make a million dollars." As an adult, that's one of those decisions that I think that would all factor in on what whether or not, you know, school A versus school B gets my most attention. So the fact that, you know, 17 and 18 year old kids are just like, Oh, I'm not real sure how to address this other than saying, uh, you know, that's not a priority. That's the situation that we've allowed to, to occur. And by we, I mean, those, I guess, related to, to football, collegiate football right now, ultimately it's NCAA in my opinion, that has made things so ambiguous as to what's allowed, what's not, uh, what can be shared, what is not shared. 
there's so much speculation that's going on as to why players have chosen certain places or what's being said on these recruiting trips um, and what the relationship is between the school and the NIL and the collectives. Uh, it's, it's not well done and it's created ambiguity. It's also, I think, put these student potential student athletes in a precarious situation that they don't want to uh, overstep or, or get out of bounds. In the time we have left, I want to talk about some of the stuff coming out of the Georgia Spring scrimmage from Saturday. John, we continue to hear good things about these wide receivers. And I would say that we talked about Gunnar Stockton a little earlier, one of the guys I'm looking forward to seeing. Some of the stuff involving Georgia receivers, I am just really, really eager to see on Saturday. I love what we're hearing about Colby Young, the big, tall receiver who apparently has been a touchdown machine in some of these Georgia practices here thus far. Positive reviews for Arian Smith, who – if the light really comes on for him, experience now, blazing speed, already been a big player in big games, that's a potential game-changing uh, talent that Georgia could have if all of that's really coming together. Anthony Heavens, we're hearing good stuff about him. Like, How excited are you when you hear about this large collection of Georgia receivers trying to establish a hierarchy, trying to figure out the pecking order, but at different times, certainly a large number of these players seemingly have performed very well. How energizing is that for you to hear that coming out of this position group? I love it. And and I think Georgia fans across the board should as well, just because this has always been a position group where I feel like we've had one or two guys. Now there's so much depth there and competition of highly talented quality players, including those that have transferred in uh, either last year or this year that are added to some really highly touted and well-skilled players that were recruited to Georgia out of high school. So, you know, a guy like Arian Smith, you talk about a, a, if he could just be more consistent with his hands, there's not a defensive back in, in the country that isn't scared of his speed and his ability to change games by just getting over the top. So you add that with some of the transfers from last year with Ra Ra and love it transfers from this year, Colby. Uh, I mean, there should be excitement. Dylan Bell seems to be uh, a name that uh, I don't know how he gets lost in the shuffle. Mm -hmm. His ability to create plays in the middle and towards the end of the season for Georgia last year. Uh, there are so many names that Georgia fans should be like, I, you know, who's it going to be this week? And G-Day will be a great opportunity to kind of see some new faces with some new opportunities. I mean, it's, it's surprising in most years for Georgia at that position group specifically, you lose a guy like Ladd and others, and you're going, mm, I don't know, you know, is there going to be a drop-off? That certainly isn't the sentiment coming out of Athens, uh, nor anyone that has seen the program and looks at that list and depth that goes, this might be a real strength for Georgia this season. How about anything else for you? For, and we'll finish with this. Just – Anything else that's sort of on your mind as someone who watches the game perhaps a little bit different than we do because of the high level in which you played the game, what else are you looking forward to seeing on Saturday? We'll make this our last thought from you. What, what else are you looking forward to seeing on Saturday? Yeah, it's, it's not flashy, but I certainly would like to see these edge players, this uh, the, uh, the defensive line, How what's the rotation? look I, Less about rotation, but who are the guys that are really going to step up? You know, is it – Wilson or Gabe or uh, some of these guys that are expected to be able to add some pressure to these quarterbacks and affect these highly talented offensive line. Georgia has a great offensive line. You look at the experience. You look at the guys that are coming back in the depth. I want to see how uh, our, our defensive front and the edge players specifically uh, can step up and make an impact at that position because, you know, the SEC championship game, still lingers in most of our minds as an area that, you know, in a matchup that uh, in a heavyweight bout matters, we probably lost that space and, and Alabama had the superiority there. So um, what's the progression look like from that defensive front and edge players specifically? So let me ask you, because you touched on this before, so much about the edge play in a spring game is a judgment call, right? It's like the officials blow the whistle. They feel like the the, the edge guys get that path to quarterback. And so sometimes that's a little bit hard for someone like me to evaluate. So tell me what I can look for, whether it be you know a 3-4 defensive end hand in the ground or a stand-up outside linebacker. 
kind of give me an idea of of what it is I'm looking to see. Is it first step? Is that quickness? You know, how, how do you judge how well a player's playing when, you know, they're not playing full-on football because they obviously can't bring quarterbacks to the ground? Yeah, well, <laughs> For, for most of us, we can see who wins and, and, and how quickly it happens. Now, if, if you touch a quarterback and it's been four seconds, that's not a win for you. I mean, that's one of those where it's, it's a spring game or a scrimmage and, you know, they'll claim it and they'll put it on, you know, their particular stat sheet, but that doesn't, uh, that's not going to translate very well come season. One, I'm looking for the guy that flashes, mm -hmm. specifically in pass rush. Two, can they hold the point? Uh, yeah, it, it's competitive. It's not going to be uh, anything flashy with the scheme. So can you win those one-on-one -on -one battles? And you know, Coach Smart was talking about it earlier this week about you know, other teams looking for those 300-plus pound defensive linemen that are, that are hard to find, and Georgia has a few of them. Well, let's see that. I, mm -hmm. I think a guy like Warren Brinson, we know that he can provide pass rush on the interior – how about some of these younger guys? Can they flash? Can they win those one-on-ones? Because it's not going to be a blitz package. It's not going to be a dog pressure that I'm looking for. I'm looking to see guys, can they win their one-on-one -on -one battles? And against Georgia's offensive line, when you win those, it means something. So uh, it, it's, it's a good opportunity for them to not rely on scheme. We're not relying on slants and movement. It's can I win these one-on-ones? And when you see guys do that, you're going, okay, now now we've got something to work with that will translate come the fall. John, really strong stuff. Appreciate your time here today. Always love your insight, and we're obviously looking forward to uh, G-Day on Saturday. That means next week we had to come back and uh, get your thoughts about exactly what it was that we did get to see. It's a really good time to be a uh, Georgia sports fan, and obviously Georgia football there in particular. John, appreciate your time, and hope you have a great week, and we'll look forward to talking to you again soon. By the way, let me also say this before we let you go. Uh, you guys had a great spring break trip last week. Uh, you had some very interesting stuff going on. How was all of that? It was fantastic. We went to Guadalupe in the wow. Caribbean, uh, an island, and had the best time. Beautiful beaches, beautiful waterfalls. I uh, hope all the rest of Dog Nation that was able to enjoy spring break had a good one. And now I'm looking forward to watching, uh, even though it's a, just a spring game, anytime we get to watch Georgia football, it's a good thing. So, I'm excited about G-Day and uh, what's coming up for these dogs. Such an exotic travel location. I'm very impressed by that, John. Well, you know what? I've been fortunate. We like to travel to the beach. We get to, uh, we've been to a lot of places, and that wasn't really on the radar, and we hadn't been, so we're like, let's check it out. And it was, uh, it was unique, and we had an awesome time. I'd highly recommend it. Well, you deserve it, John. You and your family all do, so I'm glad you all had a good time. Thanks for being here today. We'll look forward to talking to you again very soon. Can't wait. Go dogs. Sounds great. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Fruit. Mentioned it being a great time to be a sports fan here in the state of Georgia. Obviously, we got Masters coming up this week. We're fired up about that. Today is also, let me give a shout out here, the 50th anniversary of what we still believe is the home run record, 755 uh, home runs. The uh, anniversary for 715 is tonight, 50 years ago. Here in Atlanta, Hank Aaron off Al Downing and the Los Angeles Dodgers hit that home run. So huge ceremony plan for Truist Park. I know here this evening that's going to be an incredible thing and what an incredible thing to look back on. Obviously, if you've been to Truist Park, you know the, you know some of the great stuff they have sort of celebrating that legacy of Hank Aaron and kind of what the Braves have in sort of their, that's not Monument Park, whatever they call it. You know their their, their uh, you know wonderful collection of artifacts and, and historic moments. So a lot to celebrate and commemorate Hank Aaron already and. Uh, Truist Park, and tonight celebrating that 50th anniversary. That is a, a really fun thing, and all of that is going down. Now, speaking of exotic vacations and having a great time, well, obviously, we're looking forward to going cruising around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. And we're now only, is it right, two weeks away from the Dog Nation cruise? I can't even believe that. It's so much fun to think about. And I, I love all of the exotic Caribbean locales that our friends at Royal Caribbean give you a chance to experience here right now as well, including perfect day coco k i mean how good is all of this and the fact that we get a chance to sail there here pretty soon y'all know any royal caribbean cruise vacation i take uh, i want to start with those itineraries that are going to perfect day coco k i want to be a part of that i want to experience that i love walking the uh the uh, you know the, the the boat slip there the with, with the uh, the ship lands and 
you get off and you, st you start heading towards that. You got the thrill side with the tallest water slide in North America. You get the helium balloon that goes up and looks out over all of the uh, area there. Oasis Lagoon, the largest freshwater pool in the Bahamas. There's so much that makes Perfect Day Coke OK an unbelievable experience. And our friend Jessica Slater, special travel agent selected for us by Royal Caribbean, she can help you out with all of your opportunities to get to Perfect Day Coke OK sometime here in 2024. You can give her a call, 770-718-9147. That's 770-718-9147. You can also email her, jslaterdreamvacations.com, and she can tell you about all of that. All right, let's go cruise around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean here for a moment. And early in the show, we talked about Julian Juju Lewis says, my development is more important to me than anything. What we said was, well, if development's what you value, then why not play for the best coach in all of college football? And according to ESPN.com, uh, unanimously, Kirby Smart was selected as college football's top coach for 2024. Perhaps no surprise. The rest of the list does start to get a little bit interesting. First of all, <laughs> I guess old habits die hard. ESPN's love for Alabama not slowing down anytime soon. We've got Kalen DeBoer coming in as the number two coach in college football. So apparently ESPN's already seen enough. Uh, DeBoer is now the second best coach in all of college football. They got Kyle Whittingham at number three, Dabo Sweeney at number four, Mike Norvell at number five, Dan Lanning's number six, Steve Sarkeesian's number seven, Lane Kiffin's number eight, uh, Lance Lee, but what you can tell, Chris Lowe had a great influence on this list, and then Ryan Day comes at number 10. So what's interesting is, is the other day uh, on three had their ranking. They had Brian Kelly number two. ESPN doesn't even have him in the top 10. But either way, whether it be somebody else's list or this list or whatever else, here's the point I want to get to. You know, Dabo, for now, seems like his star is sort of falling a little bit. Uh, Kalen DeBoer, I guess he could be number two. He obviously had a very good run through the uh, college ball playoff this past year. But the truth is, there's a very that's a pretty small resume overall. The point we're getting to is somebody's going to be the second best coach, and some collection of coaches need to make up the top ten. There has never been a time in which the the – scenario was as wide open for Georgia and more success as it is right now. That Kirby Smart clearly is undoubtedly the best coach in college football and a chance to sort of add to that legacy right now while the rest of the competition and the rest of the programs aren't quite as fully built out as what Georgia currently is. Such an important opportunity awaiting UGA and it's the kind of thing that, that won't last forever. We said this a few years ago when it came to you know, the dominance that Georgia was showing over the SEC East. What we said was somehow, some way, eventually that might end. And what we thought was eventually Florida would build itself back up or Tennessee might build itself up. And at various times and to various levels of success, both those programs have tried that. But what really ultimately happened was the division just gone away. All of a sudden now, you know, Georgia's playing a little bit tougher schedule because they don't have Kentucky and Vanderbilt and teams like that on the schedule each and every year. So the advantage that you enjoy won't last forever. And the current advantage Georgia enjoys over the rest of the country, that's not going to last forever either. So if we believe that we're kind of in a period of time in which we're sort of in the middle of the Kirby Smart era, it's these middle years that I think are going to prove to be incredibly important for just how substantial the eventual coaching legacy of Smart becomes. Because right now, while you have unprecedented advantages over the teams you're competing with, Doing something to take advantage of that is going to be incredibly, incredibly important. Hoarding success and hoarding championships here right now, if you're able to do that, this is the time to make it happen because there is no obvious second-best coach, and there is no program right now built up to the level that Georgia is. You know, Jim Harbaugh and Michigan won the national championship, but Harbaugh's not there anymore. We believe that Michigan's kind of off the radar this season in a follow-up to that, and you know, teams that want to get there like Ohio State, let's see it happen first before we believe it's actually going to happen. Georgia stands alone atop college football, taking full advantage of the built-in advantages that Georgia currently enjoys that is going to be of paramount importance for these dogs here in future years. There is a fascinating story taking place in SEC basketball here today. It started out as a rumor, but it didn't last very long as a rumor. It is now a fact. John Calipari is leaving Kentucky to go to Arkansas. Big dollars to do so, also perhaps running from what was certainly a suddenly very sour situation there in Lexington. Kentucky fans just fed up with losing the first round of the tournament each and every year, as you imagine they would be. And so John Calipari is moving on. Now, 
there was a time in the past when Calipari was still at Memphis that he also briefly flirted with the Arkansas job there as well. It is a good job for basketball. Bud Walton Arena, you know, a good arena, uh, pretty good support out there from the fan base overall. They also have big boosters. This is one of the things you got to understand about uh, Arkansas is um, they probably have a little bit more money attached to the program than you probably realize. Jerry Jones, Cowboys owner, the Walton family, and also the Tyson Foods uh, family there as well. And apparently it's the Tyson Foods family that we're led to believe uh, has greatly influenced this, and apparently they're contributing a lot of the money to get Calipari to come. The question you would ask if you're Arkansas is, are you sure this is a good basketball coach right now for you to invest this level of finances in? Perhaps in the case of Arkansas, he's just better than what they have had and the kind of big splash you know, they want to make or it's what a booster wants to do, so therefore we're going to do this. And now it sets up a situation of what comes next for Kentucky and how wild is this coaching search going to get? you got to think they reach out to Jay Wright. I'm sure they take a swing at Danny Hurley. I'm guessing they probably strike out on both of those. And then, you know, no shortage of people on the Internet currently saying they set their sights on Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and taking Nate Oates away from the Crimson Tide. It is fair to point out that we talked a moment ago about coaches trying to ascend to the sort of top status of their sport. Nate Oates is taking a big stride in that direction when it comes to uh, college basketball. He is uh, certainly earning respect as a coach, the kind of coach that you would imagine Kentucky would be interested in. So we'll watch this and see, does Kentucky go try to spend big to steal oats for another SEC team? How disappointing will Alabama fans be if that's the case? And that could be the most fun part of all of this. So let's keep our eyes on that. Speaking of basketball, we'll give you an update on our Golden Shoe Bracket Challenge here in a moment. But let me also remind you that tonight, March Madness comes to a, uh, a conclusion. And I believe that UConn-Purdue for the championship should prove to be, I, I would think, a pretty fun and pretty interesting game. I, I think that, I think this should be pretty good. My guess is it's going to be UConn here, but obviously the presence of Edie, the big man, certainly gives Purdue a chance. And they've clearly kind of recast themselves after the embarrassments of previous tournaments. This is a much different kind of Purdue team here right now. Um, and we'll, so we'll, so we'll, we'll see if they have an answer for UConn. And I think it should be a pretty good game. Uh, looking forward to that. I'll also give a shout out here to South Carolina who wins the women's basketball tournament on Sunday there as well. And, that kind of brings the Caitlin Clark era to an end uh, there at Iowa. One of the great storied careers that we've seen, both in terms of what she did on the floor, but also in the interest that she generated for her sport. This is a real thing. This was not, you know, an exaggeration. Caitlin Clark has been truly a phenomenon in women's basketball. The sport has benefited because of it. I will say this, though, that when you look at the way in which the sport of women's basketball has kind of risen and uh, its attention and its TV ratings and all the ways in which you measure that, Clark deserves the lion's share of that credit. There's no doubt about that. But there's also an aspect in which you know, a lot of these SEC teams have fairly sizable fan bases. A few years ago, Mississippi State did. LSU obviously does. Historically, Tennessee has. South Carolina does there as well. That there is a presence of some fans already for that version of the sport. A lot of that's been in the SEC. So when Caitlin Clark comes along and becomes the phenomenon that she's become, it's fair to point out that the growth of that sport has also been enabled because of the infrastructure that was kind of already in place in conferences like the SEC here. Now, do I think this sport will be as popular next year with Caitlin Clark now no longer playing college basketball? No, I don't. But but I do think that it's fair to point out that when it comes to women's basketball in the SEC, that's been a sort of a star on the rise here uh, for a good number of years as it is. And obviously, you know, the South Carolina team has been, you know, a juggernaut. Dawn Staley's putting herself the conversation for, you know, top coaches for sure. So a big win for South Carolina and a phenomenal career of Caitlin Clark comes to a close. And we'll see what's next for, you know, that version of the sport in the post-Caitlin Clark era. And we'll make that cruising around the SEC courtesy of Royal Caribbean. Now, on Saturday, we're looking forward to being back at the UGA Bookstore. So excited about that. It'll be our home for our Dog Nation pregame coverage on video and also our Dog Nation postgame show after the game there as well. We are excited about both those things. We're also excited about some of the things ongoing at the UGA Bookstore right now. Charlie Conant hits another home run here this weekend. Diamond Dogs, though, not able to get the series win against Mississippi State. Well, it was sort of a wild three days worth of games for sure. But Condon is on a pace kind of unmatched by anybody in Georgia baseball history. And now you get a chance to be a part of your own version of that history of the Charlie Condon by seeing him be the very first current Georgia baseball player to have a jersey on sale at the UGA Bookstore. The UGA Bookstore for a long time has been the place to get your UGA apparel needs, and now it's your spot to get 
uh, Charlie Condon Diamond Dogs baseball jersey there as well. So as you're shopping there on Saturday, look out for the Charlie Condon baseball jerseys if you're going there for a G-Day. And uh, you can go ahead and pick one of those up and support uh, Georgia's NIL efforts in, in, in light of all that there as well. Also, if you can't be there in person, you can also shop the UJ Bookstore online and get your Charlie Condon a jersey there today. Great stuff going down. Diamond Dogs, Charlie Condon, they're at the UGA Bookstore. You can pick up his jersey and hope to, we'll get a chance to see you at the UGA Bookstore coming up on Saturday there as well for Dog Nation pregame and postgame coverage right there from the UGA Bookstore. So as we wrap up here today, our Golden Shoe, I want to give you an update on our Golden Shoe Bracket Challenge. I believe this is still up for grabs here right now. I believe what we have is, so Shanna Jarrett has been on top the entire time. And she's sitting at 114 points. Second place right now is Stephen England, who's three points behind her. I think I've got this right. According to the rules, we're using CBS Sports for our bracket contest, which I just picked at random. There's no real reason we're using CBS. But according to the bracket rules, I believe tonight's championship game is worth 32 points. So Shannon and Stephen both have Purdue winning. The next two people in line are... Uh, our buddy Randy Hall, he's at 100 points right now. And then Blair Calhoun's at 99. So I don't know that I have this 100% right, but I believe it comes down to Shanna versus Randy. If Purdue wins, that means Shanna wins. And if UConn wins, I believe that means Randy wins. I think I've got that right. Obviously, all this is done online for us. But I believe that's how that's going to play out. So that should be a very interesting thing to observe here this evening. So we'll be watching that closely. As far as the lousy, stinking Gators go, unlike Randy and Shannon who have a chance to win, Florida really doesn't have a chance to win much of anything these days. Got beat up bad in baseball again this weekend, too. You hate to see that if you're a, uh, if you're a Gator. But either way, 1,248 days. That's how long it's been since Georgia has beaten, or I should say since Florida has beaten Georgia. We love that. It's our Gator Hater Updater. Y'all have a great day. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Dog Nation Daily, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. And on video, time now for the R.S. Andrews Cooldown. R.S. Andrews, the one you turn to for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, electric needs. They show up on time. They do the work that's promised. The price is promised. You can trust R.S. Andrews on all of that. Let's take some of your comments here today, and we'll find out what's on your mind. Howard Eubank says Condon should be a number one draft pick. Yeah, no doubt. I guess it'll be not this upcoming draft, but next year's draft. He'll be eligible for the first time. And I'd say there's a chance that he is the number one overall pick. Certainly in a conversation to be that. And uh, one of those guys that could be a very, you know, respected prospect for a long time to come. Uh, Foster Moss says he went to the bookstore on Saturday to get his $100 autograph from uh, BA. Well, listen, I can promise you my autograph doesn't cost $100. I'd just love to see you, Foster. So come on by to see us. We'll be very happy to have you there. Um, <laughs> Jonathan here. No, I did not get arrested. Uh, for Cody Rhodes finishing a story. But I told our first and 15 audience before, I thought WrestleMania was amazing. And I thought the main event, you know, because, like, you know, WrestleMania is about 50 hours long. And so throughout the weekend, I'm kind of in on some of it, out on some of it. I didn't see all of it, in other words. I didn't see, uh, uh, you know, the Intercontinental title match, Gunther losing, um, uh, uh I did so there. Are, I didn't get a chance to see the the Seth Rollins, Drew McIntyre ma match last night, but um, uh, Sami Zayn, by the way, beating Gunther. But I did get a chance to see both the main events. I thought the Saturday night was pretty good. I thought last night was really amazing. And in fact, I said this a little earlier. I don't think there's a movie this year that's going to be as much of a crowd pleaser as WrestleMania was last night. It was just. So well done. Obviously an important WrestleMania because it's kind of the start of a new era for that that company. And that's a real thing, not a, not a storyline thing. Um, but as far as the storyline goes, they told it so well last night. So good. And obviously we're happy for Cody Rhodes, who is a, uh, you know, Georgia fan and, a, you know, a Georgian, you know, grew up here. Uh, uh, so there you go. Foster Moss says, don't load my ball myself on autographs. I, I said $1,000. Well, listen, if you want to give me $1,000, I'm not going to turn it down. Unlike un unlike Juju Lewis, I'm more than happy to be all about the NIL. So if y'all want to pay me, I I'll, I'll be more than happy to take that money. Um, let us see what else. Uh, oh, Jonathan Aaron asking a question about Caitlin Clark, about whether or not she's an all-time great for not winning with, with not winning a championship. 
So this is where my ignorance of women's basketball probably comes in. Like what I don't know is is what level of team she had around her compared to you know what other you know players would have had. But when you talk about Caitlin Clark, the one thing that I think that you have to include in the discussion is what she did for the overall popularity of women's basketball. That's what you've got to include in this. And frankly, if we're just being completely honest, some of the sort of criticism you're seeing of her, or maybe skepticism is a better word, some of that are just people who are jealous that she's so popular. I mean, if you really want to break it down, like what I know about women's basketball could fit into a cup. But um, but everybody knows about Caitlin Clark. I mean, this is a real phenomenon. This is not some sort of media exaggeration. Like, people genuinely care about her. Um, I, I've seen enough examples away from the Internet, away from TV. This is not just some sort of ESPN creation. This is a real thing that's happening. And um, some of the skepticism of her of, like, well, she, you know, like I saw the one, you know, you know, she played with a three-point shot. And, you know, there's been all kinds of, like, you know, like little nitpicks about Clark along the way. A lot of that is just old-fashioned jealousy. She's just far more popular than anybody that's ever come before her. And, and some people don't like her for that. I would say that's what it is. Now, as I said before, I think there's also an infrastructure that's in place for college basketball in particular that's aided all of this. To be honest with you, I don't think this phenomenon continues unabated going into the WNBA. I just don't. I mean, she'll obviously be popular, and that league will benefit from her presence there. But – the most popular WNBA player is never going to be as popular as the most popular college player because college athletics are just really, really popular. We have seen, you know, the, we, we've seen this extend beyond just women's basketball. Women's basketball seems like the headline here because it's so much more popular than it used to be. But look at other sports. Obviously, you know, football ratings have been up. Men's basketball ratings, I think, have been pretty good. But, like, in the springtime, softball and baseball and things like that, they've all benefited from higher ratings because – our country still really, really likes college athletics. So, you know, the phenomenon of Caitlin Clark will not be as significant in the WNBA as it was in women's college basketball because America just doesn't like the WNBA as much as it likes college athletics. That that some of that is the sort of overlapping phenomenon of people still really like representing Iowa or LSU or South Carolina or UConn or whatever team that is, and also the sort of cult of personality that has been developed around, you know, Caitlin Clark as well. Um, like Nature Gator says he'd never really watched women's game before, but watching Caitlin Clark just to see her play, she was spectacular on the court, made everyone around her better too. Yeah, I mean, you know, those are pretty much universally the the the, the viewpoints of what of what she brought to the table, and that's why I think that South Carolina does deserve so much credit for actually winning the game and getting it done. It seems like they were, I mean, at least people who saw the game would say, were a far better team, it seems like. Um, uh, let us see where else. Uh, Frank Batterson says, did you see the Masters promo that Georgia put out with the Booming Onion? That's uh, a Brett Thorson as Jim Nance. It's amazing. Plus, the highlights they selected were hilarious. I'll have to go seek that out, Frank. I haven't seen that yet, but I'll go seek that out. That sounds really funny. I'll come back to YouTube here in a minute. Let me go to dognation.com for a moment. Uh, Richard Deese, was I live in attendance for the wrestling match? I was not, but I'll give you a little known fact. I have been to three WrestleManias. I was at WrestleMania 13 in Chicago. I was at WrestleMania 14 in Boston. I was at WrestleMania 15 in Philadelphia. This was when I was young and dumb and didn't have any responsibilities, and I could go traveling to watch wrestling. Um, I, I did get a chance to attend the live uh, SmackDown in Atlanta a few months ago. Um, so I had not actually not been to a live wrestling event a good number of years prior to that. But when I was in my teens, you know, uh, young guy, you know, kind of transitioning to college life, went to a good, well, we went to a good number of live wrestling events, but did not go. I heard it was very cold. You know, it was outside in the football stadium in Philadelphia and Saturday night, I thought the crowd was pretty, pretty bad. Uh, it was cold. There was very little you know, wrestling the crowd is sort of part of the story. How the crowd reacts kind of helps tell the story of what's going on. I thought the crowd was really flat on Saturday night. I thought it was a much better crowd on Sunday, and I believe it was maybe a little bit warmer. It was also a little shorter show, I think, too, which probably benefited from that. Um, k Dog says, will there be a post-game show on Saturday? There will be a uh, live from the UGA bookstore, as we always are. Same as always. Take your Zoom calls. 
We'll let you show up in person and kind of rant if you want to a little bit. We'll do it all with you on Saturday. We're looking forward to that. Uh, DT says that Dave Snow's coming all the way from Kenya to see us at the bookstore. Dave, that's awesome. Man, I'm so happy to hear that. Dave, I can't wait to meet you in person. That's great to hear. Uh, uh, that That's awesome. Awesome. Uh, Rambo says that uh, Lincoln Riley's got the uh, resume for quarterback development. Unfortunately for USC, that's all he's got. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously Lincoln Riley does have a great history of the quarterbacks. We can't dispute that. But when you look at the Caleb Williams career, the question you have to ask yourself is, was that what you, was that what he wanted it to be? Was that what people thought it was going to be? And how much of the ways in which uh, Caleb kind of came up short in his career, how much was that because he was a part of a deficient program? In other words, if you're a quarterback, there's more than just being developed as a quarterback. You have to be developed as a program, too, because quarterbacks are judged on wins and losses. And right now, you know, Caleb is going to be the number one overall pick. But you know, there's a little bit of scrutiny that's out there about him, and some of that's just because he didn't win enough in college. And so, you know, the idea of development, obviously your own personal development really matters, and getting a chance to to go on to the NFL is, I mean, that's got to be your most, you know, most important thing. But in addition to that, you know, there's also the, you know, the thought here of what kind of team can I play on? Because quarterbacks are judged on wins and losses. Uh, K Dog says, I'm scared of Zoom because I need to keep my identity off the grid. Yeah, a lot of y'all enjoy your anonymous status, and I kind of understand that. I think that being anonymous online is certainly a justifiable point of view. Uh, I wonder if we could ever get to the point where you have like voice disclosure stuff and like the, you know, like you do like the, you know, like the 60 minute like expose type interview where, you know, you got the, you got like the shadow, you can't see the person. And they're talking like this. Like, I wonder if we could ever get to the, like, the voice disguiser thing at some point in time. For those of you who want to protect your anon status, we'll see if we can give you a chance to do that. Uh, Randy Hall asked me if we're wearing a different shirt. Yeah, um, I've worn this shirt before, but I actually haven't worn this in a few weeks. So I would say a couple of things I wore at the end of last week were not different shirts. But this is, I haven't worn this in a while. Um, let me go to Dog Nation on Facebook for a moment. On the Facebook. Alan Verbonchik, Lucy Bowers Boykins uh, in here having a conversation. Robert Brown wants to see the defensive line step up for Georgia on Saturday. Hope that's the case. Uh, Johnny Prescott says, I finally found the long drink peach flavor of the weekend. Um, he wants to uh, save a couple to pair the pimento cheese sandwich over the weekend with the quintessential Georgia-style Masters viewing. That sounds like a really good idea. You know, one of the things that Augusta National is famous for is the sort of peach ice cream sandwich. A little peach-flavored version of the finished long drink. I'd say that is a, uh, taking it up to an either higher level than that. So, Johnny, that's, uh, that's tremendous stuff. I really appreciate that. Well done by you on that for sure. Uh, really like to see that. Uh, really, really good stuff. Uh, let's see what else. Yeah, so I hope you enjoy that, Johnny. I'm glad the peach-flavored version of the finished long drink took good care of you. That's great. Jerry Popham on subject of me going to WrestleMania. Jerry, I, you said before you don't like wrestling, but listen, I make no apology for that. I like what I like. Um, I, You know, I don't get all that into what other people like. I don't get it all into the, um, to, to what I like. It's one of those things where, you know, I don't feel pressure to like things just because other people do. And I don't feel pressure to, like, like the one thing I've given up on. There was a time in my life when you want to go back, let's say, 10, 15 years ago. It was very important to me. And I'm ashamed to say this, but it's true. 20 years ago, for sure. Very important to me to sort of aspire to be viewed as like sophisticated and fancy and, you know, <laughs> wanted to do things that I thought sophisticated people did. Very important. Very wanted to be seen a certain kind of way. Very important to sort of aspire to a certain kind of class status, for lack of a better way of saying it. Really, really important to me. Um, there's nothing happier, at least for me, nothing better than the moment when you just give all that up. 
and you just say, here's who I am, and this is what I'm about, and it's either good enough for people or it's not, but it is true to me. I love that. I love that. So um, there is a certain kind of sophistication where pro wrestling does not fit in very well, but thankfully I no longer aspire to that level of social achievement, and so therefore I'm just safe to now just be what I want to be. I'm so happy about that. Um, Gary Holt says Carson Beck needs to have a big year. It could change a lot of things in the recruiting for wide receiver, future quarterback. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. Now, in the case of Juju, that decision is likely made prior to Beck having the kind of year that he has. And the truth is, in all quarterbacks like this, this is not unique to Julian Lewis. So whether Beck has the big year or not, we think he probably is going to, but whether it does or not, Jude, let me tell you how Juju thinks. I don't know Juju personally, but let me tell you how he thinks because all quarterbacks think this way. Whatever Carson Beck does, in your mind, if you're a quarterback like Julian Lewis, you think, well, that doesn't really matter because I'm better than him anyway. Um, and that's what all these quarterbacks think. And two years from now, the next Juju Lewis is going to look at the current Juju Lewis and say, well, I don't care what he does. I'm better than he is anyway. That's just the way that thought process sort of works. So I do agree with you that if Georgia – can follow up a Heisman finalist career for Stetson Bennett with a with a Carson Beck being drafted in the first round, Georgia's got a real thing to sell. And it probably won't impact the recruitment of Juju Lewis, but it could impact him for a long time to come. And maybe more important, it's not just Georgia saying, hey, come here, we can develop you because look what we did for these guys. It's come here and you may have to be patient but eventually it's going to pay off for you. Because that's the other part of the Carson Beck thing is. It's not just look what we did for Carson Beck, but look what we did for Carson Beck, dot, 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 even though he had to wait for a little while. And that's the thing I believe that Georgia really wants to sell. And the success of Beck could give them the, the credibility to really be able to do that. Uh, let us see what else. Back here on YouTube here for a moment. Paul Moon says, I've been saying this forever, but I doubt we get Juju. It's been to follow. It's been fun to follow. So I agree on the last part of that for sure. Either way, it's kind of a cool soap opera. If I like pro wrestling, obviously I like sort of male-oriented soap operas. And so this is just sort of a fun soap opera, and I don't make any apologies for the fact that I'm sort of entertained by the by the the drama of it all. I, I do kind of find that to be pretty fun. And I have a fairly high tolerance for recruiting related drama. And I would say that I've spent most of the last couple of years pretty skeptical that Juju comes to Georgia. But as I tried to allude to a little earlier, and look, my predictions are not worth a nickel, but if another quarterback that Georgia is supposedly chasing, if he announces his commitment prior to Juju taking his official visit, I mean, that's kind of means something, right? Now, you could say, well, maybe it doesn't because if Georgia – loses that on Juju, it'll just go back and steal one of these two guys that commit elsewhere here right now. Uh, and maybe that's what they'll do. Who knows? But, I mean, the fact that non-Juju Lewis quarterbacks are accelerating their timeline so much, I mean, there's something to read into that, right? Or at least it's fairly easy to read into it, correct? Uh, whether it turns out to be true or not. Uh Stick D's on the subject of allocating some funds and laws. I mean, the state of Georgia has changed its NIL law, I think. So uh, I think you can fairly, you know, uh, I think you can fairly well get whatever he wants. Um, Chicken Bone News says patience is a rare thing for these kids. I'd say for the most part that's probably true. But, you know, when you can show patience being rewarded, maybe you can convince them of that. Uh, Jonathan Aaron says, the reason I ask if Caitlin Clark is an all-time great for not winning a championship, it's the Dan Marino argument, going back to a great quarterback who didn't win a Super Bowl. He says, people say Dan, is he, Dan isn't even, though he said all kinds of records he never won. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I would say that, I'd say that Marino is in the category of top quarterbacks, but Marino wouldn't make my Mount Rushmore of quarterbacks, I don't think. That line of demarcation of like a top four, top five compared to like a top ten, I think Marino's got a pretty strong case to be one of the ten best quarterbacks of all time, but he would probably not make my cut for a 
top five or like a Mount Rushmore top four, and perhaps the absence of the Super Bowl is the reason why. I think that I'm going to be more likely to scrutinize pro football quarterbacks because I watch them so much more closely. Um, you know, Caitlin Clark, I'm not going to pretend to be something I'm not. I have not lived and died with every moment of the Caitlin Clark phenomenon. I'm obviously aware of who she is, but it's not like I'm an expert on all things related to Caitlin Clark. But I think because everyone knows she who she is, I think her fame has to factor into her, like, goat conversation. I think it, I think it would have to. If I was more into women's basketball, would I scrutinize her absence of a championship? I guess I might, right? I mean, I, I guess I probably would. But since I'm only kind of sort of drive-by interested in the, in the topic of Caitlin Clark to begin with, the fact that she's so famous and the fact that she generated these unbelievable – I mean, like part of how we judge – to go back to wrestling a moment ago. Part of how we judge wrestling, because it's not real, part of how we judge wrestling is the box office. And we would consider WrestleMania to be a success because the box office was so big. And I would say in the case of Caitlin Clark, you've got to look at the box office. That, that in other words, I'm a, like, I'm a, like Diana Taurasi, right? She spoke out against uh, uh, Caitlin Clark, and Diana Taurasi won, I'm guessing, several championships at UConn, right? So if you asked Diana Taurasi in a situation where – she had to tell the truth, which obviously doesn't exist in real life. But if she had to tell the truth, you can have your championships or you can have Caitlin Clark's fame. Most people, if they're really being honest, would trade those trophies for that fame. They just would. And so <laughs> what you're going to say is, well, that's a totally uh, incongruous argument. And it is kind of hypocritical, right? The sport I care about more, I'm going to judge you on your championships, things like that. You know, I'm not judging – Caitlin Clark on her championships because I don't really know the history of those championships, but I do know those that won championships would take those trophies and melt them down into, you know, whatever, if they thought they could be as famous as Caitlin Clark is right now. Um, let us see what else. Uh, Green Soldier says he thinks that Juju's giving false hope. Look, you would have plenty of reason to assume that's true. And maybe it's true here, too. Like, one thing I'm not going to do is stand up, and uh, jump up and down, give some sort of strong prediction in all of this because, you know, um, there's obviously reasons to be skeptical on a number of fronts. But this recruitment is taking an interesting turn. I'll just say it that way. Uh, in other words, if all of this is about, you know, making Georgia fans believe they're really in it for Julian, I'd say he's doing a pretty good job cultivating that. Once again, to make the comparison to wrestling that's about storylines, I'd say Juju's doing a pretty good job of writing his storyline, if that's what this is. Um, all right, final comments. We're going to go. At dognation.com. K-Dog says, thank God there's a reward for patience. Yeah, I mean, look. And it's corny to view it this way, but I do believe that college football is still a growth and development, um, you know, foundation for the players to play. That's one of the things that I think, even if we would all say, well, players have a right in some respect to transfer or a right to, to kind of, you know, take their NIL, that, you know, life also comes coupled with responsibilities. And, you know, if you're too enamored by your rights when you're younger, you're not training yourself to eventually handle your responsibilities. And so when you do see patients rewarded, you know, that's the kind of thing that seems to incentivize, you know, paying due respect to the responsibilities that life eventually throws at you. And so I think a lot of us, as old fashioned as it might be, still kind of want, you know, college football to, to be a thing that kind of makes and trains young men how to be full fledged men. I think that's the case. And DT also pointing out that Gunnar Stockton is showing some of that patience right now, which we really like to see. All right, it's time for us to go. Thanks for being here for our RS Andrews School Down. Really good stuff. Big week for us, getting ready for G-Day coming up on Saturday. A lot of like the wish list we want to see. We talked some about that as it relates to Gunnar Stockton here today. And we'll talk a lot more about that in the uh, days to come, getting you ready as we possibly can for Saturday and all the fun stuff there for that. Also, 
there's a chance. This is, I shouldn't even say this because this is not all the way built out. I may have something for you as it relates to the Masters here this week. I mean, let, let me see what I can do on this. I may have something for you on that. We'll tell you more about that here coming up. All right, uh, good stuff. Thanks for being here. Y'all check out R.S. Andrews online, rsandrews.com, for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs. Uh, got some warm weather here today, and uh, obviously we're kind of in the midst of spring here right now. So get your air conditioning unit tuned up to factory fresh specs. R.S. Andrews, you can trust them on all of that. They'll get you feeling cool and comfortable all spring and summer long. So find them online. Our friend Ari Payer on the entire team there, online, rsandrews.com. One more time, that's rsandrews.com. Have a great day. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Dog Nation Daily, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. We'll look forward to talking to you then.